Welcome to Learn with Cancer Pathways and Longevity. A special hello to all those who are viewing this program live. Please use the chat feature if you have any questions or to post any comments. Our staff is actually uh, monitoring the chat live. This program is for informational purposes only and not intended to be medical advice. And this program will be recorded for playback on demand. My name is Katie Brown with Longevity Foundation. Longevity is the nation's leading lung cancer nonprofit, and we are changing outcomes for people with lung cancer through research, education, and support. Longevity initiatives position us as thought leaders in the lung cancer advocacy community, providing programs and driving change for those with lung cancer today and in the future. Our community partner and co-host for this program is Cancer Pathways. For the past 20 years, Cancer Pathways, formerly Gilda's Club Seattle, has been offering support, education, and community for people impacted by cancer. We'll hear more about their programs and meet their team later on in this webinar. Our first presenters for the first hour are Dr. Amy Moore and Dr. Upal Basuroy. Dr. Moore will provide an update on the pandemic, vaccines, what we currently know about variants, and Dr. Basuroy will give us an update on the programs, uh, on the progress and the hope in lung cancer research. Thank you both so much for being here. Thank you, Katie. Dr. Moore, I'd like to start with you. Can you Please briefly introduce yourself to um, our attendees and share with us any latest updates um, on COVID-19. Sure. Hi, everybody. I'm Amy Moore. I'm Longevity's Vice President of Global Engagement and Patient Partnerships. My background is I'm actually a PhD trained virologist. So that's why I have become kind of the COVID point person for longevity. Um, but I also trained in cancer research and have been in the nonprofit sector working on large cancer initiatives for over a decade now. Um, and I'm seeking to expand on longevity's work around clinical trials transformation, precision medicine, and expand that internationally, working with uh, other key stakeholders um, to advance some of those objectives. But I know there's been a lot of news this week about COVID-19 and the new variant called Omicron. So we thought we would just kick that off um, as we move closer to the holidays and give you kind of a status of where we are and what we know at this time. So first, um, Omicron is the newest variant in the COVID family, COVID-19 family. So you're all very familiar with Delta at this point, which has been the source of all of our challenges here in the U.S. Um, since, you know, the summer and, and now um, continuing into the fall. Omicron was first identified by scientists in South Africa about a week ago. Um, they do some sophisticated testing just to monitor kind of what's circulating and they uncovered this new kind of variant. And what's different about it compared to Delta, the original strain, Alpha, Beta, and the others that you've heard about is it has a complex kind of constellation of mutations. So it's one of the most highly mutated variants that we have of COVID-19 so far. So it's got about 50 mutations. And what's most concerning to scientists in this space is that it has about 30 mutations in the spike protein. So when you see those cartoon representations of the virus, it's got these spikes coming out of it. Those uh, mutations are kind of what they say are on the crown of the spike. And that's what the spike is what actually binds the receptor on our cells to allow it to infect us. So it's expected, or we have concerns that because of these additional mutations, the virus may, and I use may because we don't know yet, it may escape current vaccines and monoclonal antibodies. But what we're working to understand over the next couple of weeks, because these tests do take time, is one, is the virus more transmissible than Delta? Early data coming out of South Africa suggests that it is highly transmissible. We're seeing kind of an exponential growth of the virus there so far. Um, does it cause more severe disease? Um, that's important to know. Um, the early indications out of South Africa say that at least thus far, again, early days, that it may cause mild disease, but again, we don't know. For the lung cancer community, again, that was mostly in younger, healthy individuals. And we know that the lung cancer community is 
very susceptible to worse outcomes from um, COVID-19. We don't know what the implications are yet for those with cancer, those who are immunocompromised. So we need to be cautious and monitor the situation. Um, will this variant escape vaccines? That's to be determined. Those studies are underway. So scientists around the world are kind of testing um, current vaccines to see if they'll continue to provide protection. So um, again, uh, why was it named Omicron? We're trying to give designations that don't stigmatize the variant. So we don't know actually where Omicron um, first arose. It was detected in South Africa, but we know from the news here in the US this week that it's been detected in California, in New York, in Minnesota, in a growing list of states. And the timeline shows that it was here even before it was detected in South Africa. It was in Europe even before it was detected in South Africa. So at this point, it's in, in about 40 countries around the world, meaning it's already circulating. And so what can we do in the face of a new variant when Delta continues to be a major challenge here in the US? We have vaccines, we have boosters. So we're recommending that, especially people with lung cancer, the caregivers who are around those people with lung cancer, that they do get vaccinated. If you are six months or more out from getting one of the mRNA vaccines, either Pfizer or Moderna, you are recommended to, to go ahead and get your booster. If you're at least two months out from a single dose of the J&J vaccine, you are encouraged to get a booster. Now you're able to mix those boosters. So if you got J&J, &J, you may want to get an mRNA booster the second time around. So that's an option as well. Children ages five and up are also able to get vaccinated. So that's an important part of layering our defenses because the early data coming out of a South African press conference this morning showed that Omicron does appear to be sending more children to the hospital than we have seen with previous uh, variants of the virus. So protecting our youngest is important. We also have very effective, what we call non-pharmaceutical public health interventions, which can keep us safe. So we know that masks work. So you're encouraged to wear masks, especially in public or in crowded places, and many places still enforce that on public transportation, for example. Social distancing, so avoiding crowds is particularly important. We know that the case that occurred in Minnesota was a person who attended a large conference in New York City. So we have to be on guard and avoid these highly crowded settings. Washing your hands often, especially in winter months, those things keep us safe. Choosing uh, settings that have good ventilation. So we know that as winter is coming and as colder temperatures are forcing people more indoors, you know, finding places that are well ventilated is going to also help protect you. So even though the news can be a little unsettling in the face of a new variant for which we don't know very much yet, we do know that we have very effective interventions, vaccinations, as well as non-pharmaceutical, which can keep us safe. So um, I'll pause there and let people um, ask any questions, but there's going to be more data coming out in the next couple of weeks. I'll be kind of monitoring the situation on behalf of longevity and putting out updates as they become available. So. Um, I would say we need to be cautious. We don't need to panic, but we do need to be aware of what's going on. So Dr. Moore, um, the holidays are coming and people have traditions and activities and, and in some states, things are opening up, right? How can lung cancer patients keep themselves safe other than you know, being vaccinated? What are other ways that lung cancer patients can keep safe? Well, I think first and foremost, as you said, vaccination has proven to be um, very effective in patients with cancer um, and boosting as well in patients with cancer. So we know first and foremost, if you are not yet fully vaccinated, if you are six months or more out from mRNA or two months out from J&J &J and you haven't gotten that booster yet, go ahead and do it because it takes about two weeks to really kick in and, and to um, give you that protection. So that's one making sure that people in your immediate circle are also vaccinated. So caregivers, other family members, you know, choosing activities where you're among vaccine individuals. It's much riskier to partake in activities where you're in mixed company of vaccinated and unvaccinated. So making sure you know the status of those around you um, and also layering in testing. So we do have now some very, 
um, effective at home rapid tests. I know the challenge nationally has been sometimes they can be hard to come by. Um, but layering in testing, um, you know, especially if you're going to events or gatherings, that can be um, another layer of defense to make sure that everybody who's participating is, you know, if they're not vaccinated, at least they're not um, infected at the time. I think. You know, also availing people ourselves of masks, social distancing, you know, where the weather still allows choosing outdoor um, settings versus indoor settings. All of that works to um, give you the best um, protection against getting infected with the virus. Because regardless of what's going on with Omicron, the reality is we're still seeing about 86,000 cases a day of Delta here in the U.S. And so we very much still have a large burden of COVID-19 throughout this country and we need to make smart decisions. Absolutely. So let's get to some questions. We had a question submitted um, before today that was asking about air travel. Um, if you're vaccinated, is it safe to go on a plane and go visit other family members or take a vacation? I think the good news is that plane travel has proven safer than many, you know, fear. Um, but I think we can do some things to make it even safer. So, you know, it's, it's we're two years into this pandemic and I think we're at a situation where we're having to learn how to live in balance with, with the virus. And, you know, um, I would say if you're somebody who's on active treatment, you may want to, you know, consider whether or not you absolutely need to make that trip. But if it's something which, you know, you're going to go through with, then I would say, make it as safe as possible. So we have better quality masks than we did when the pandemic first started. So, you know, KN95 masks or N95 masks, um, you know, using those is better than surgical masks. There's kind of a gradient of effectiveness when we look at different mask options. So your N95s, your KN95s are your best, followed by surgical mask, followed by kind of cloth mask. And we know that gaiters, kind of those neck things, those are really ineffective. It's almost like you're not wearing anything. So choose the best mask possible. I would say, you know, if you are somebody with lung cancer or other conditions which um, put you at greater risk, you know, avoid maybe partaking of drinks or snacks on the plane, you know, don't you kind of put yourself at that risk. But I think it, by and large, it's proven safer um, than maybe initially feared. So, you know, there's still ways that we can travel, but do it in a smart and relatively safe way. Great. Um, there are a few questions in the chat. Um, one is from Elisa, uh, her son fully vaccinated um, and caught breakthrough COVID, which was mild. Um, thankfully, and he tested negative two weeks later. How long does he need to wait for a booster? We were told two to four weeks, not three months. What are your thoughts? That um, that guidance has changed kind of on a regular basis throughout the pandemic. So I would I would always refer back to CDC guidelines in terms of the timing of boosters in the context of breakthrough infection. Um, you know, some people following natural infection, there was a recommendation that, you know, you wait three months following natural infection before kind of getting vaccinated. Um, so I would need to myself double check what the current, current guidance is as far as if you've had breakthrough infection and when you are eligible to get that um, next dose. But um, CDC guidelines are, you know, what I think the gold standard is here. And I would definitely reference that um, and talk to your doctor to make that decision. But, you know, just another example of how things have changed, you know, like we early on, we talked about, you know, you needed to stagger getting your COVID vaccine and your flu shot. Well, that has since changed to where we now allow you to get those together. So this is kind of an evolving um, understanding of what we can and can't do and what's, you know, allowed and not allowed. So um, I would just reference back to those guidelines and they cover many different topics, you know, like um, administration of multiple vaccines at once or, you know, things like the timing of, of those shots. Absolutely. I remember in the earlier days, that was a big question. Can you have the COVID-19 vaccine along with the uh, flu shot? Um, everybody wanted to know because the um, 
the, the pharmacy <laughs> was offering you both at the same time and they didn't know what to do. So that's right. Good. So you can, and if you do that, you know, you're just advised to maybe get them in different arms because, you know, you'll be yeah. sore. And should we be worrying about the flu too? Well, you know, flu activity remains by and large low in the country. We see some states um, where flu activity is increasing. Georgia is one of those. Um, New Mexico looks pretty high right now. And the CDC has a good flu, um, flu kind of tracker. So if you Google like CDC flu tracker, you can pull up kind of the national map. And right now, most of the country is green, which means there's low activity. But again, as we go into winter, we can anticipate that it may pick up, especially as people are starting to kind of, you know, not wear a mask as much and it kind of increased their risk profile. Um, there was a recent fairly large outbreak at the University of Michigan. So we know that flu is out there, um, but thankfully some of the behaviors that we're practicing to try to keep COVID at bay also keep other respiratory viruses at bay. But again, as we relax those practices, we can anticipate that flu and other respiratory viruses, colds, RSV, will continue to kind of Pick back up. So that's why we're saying it's especially important this year that people do get that flu shot because we really didn't have a flu season last year. And so when it does kind of come back, we can expect it, it could be a little bit worse than it has been because people haven't been exposed um, as recently. That makes a lot of sense. Um, a couple more questions. Uh, one from Valerie. Um, her son and, and his three young children are not vaccinated. Should she avoid being with them completely or mask with them? Do masks help? Um, we often eat and drink together, birthdays, holidays, eat, you know, et cetera. What are your recommendations? You know, it, it's, it's a hard thing to tell people they can't be with their loved ones, you know, because that emotional connection and, and family support is an important part of our mental health during the pandemic. But we also know that that carries risks to be around people who are unvaccinated. So my suggestion, um, especially if you are a patient, you know, dealing with cancer is that you choose outdoor interactions that you do um, be masked. If you're doing that, you exercise or put in place social distancing. So try to be, you know, uh, six feet at least away from each other. Um, you know, so it is risky. And um, I think every person has to evaluate their own comfort level and what risk they're willing to take. Um, because we, we recognize that, you know, family is important. It is an important part of, for patients with cancer in, you know, dealing with, with their diagnosis and navigating that um, successfully. So, um, you know, I can't tell you not to be around loved ones, but, you know, I would advise you to make smart choices as you do that. So masking and social distancing are a key piece of that. Right. And one thing that I just learned is you can buy a COVID test on Amazon. <laughs> so. You can. And many pharmacies have, you know, um, I my family uses the rapid test called Binax now. Um, so it's 15 minutes. You can swab, your, swab yourself. And, you know, I, I tend to couple those with PCR testing just because the Binax now is kind of, you know, like, kind of like a pregnancy test, there's a line or there's two lines. And is that really a line or is it not? And am I, you know, so the interpretation can be hard. Um, but I think when coupled with PCR testing that, you know, that gives you your best reassurance, but we know that PCR testing often can take time to get those results. So by next now, if you're looking at doing something day of, or, you know, just the day before, that's probably your best option um, for one of those rapid tests. So um, two more questions. Um, the first one is if you're fully vaccinated and got the booster and the flu shot, do you have to worry about COVID? Yes. Um, you know, I, I would say that's the reality. Um, and, and the challenge that we're seeing now with Omicron is that, you know, breakthrough cases are occurring even in, you know, vaccinated individuals. Now, the good news is that you're more likely to experience relatively mild or, um, you know, very minimal symptoms. So you're not going to land in the hospital with severe disease or die, but you can still get infected. You can still expose others. So um, no vaccine is 100% effective, but it greatly diminishes your risk of, of severe disease and illness. And that's the one thing that I think we need to appreciate with our current 
array of vaccine options is that they were never fully intended to block infection. They were designed to prevent severe disease leading to hospitalization and death, and they are extremely effective at doing that. What we've seen kind of diminish over time is, I mean, the the cherry on the, you know, on the top, um, the icing on the cake was that they did seem to also decrease risk of infection, but we were seeing some of that fall off or wane over time. So that's why we've advised people, you know, get topped off, go get that booster, because that, you know, seems to kind of restore some of this protection against infection. You know, we're going to need kind of different vaccines in the future on the kind of next generation vaccines to truly be an end game strategy for the pandemic. And there are multiple efforts underway to, to address that. But in the meantime, you know, boosting does kind of give you that added layer of, you know, again, protection and we expect the breakthrough would be milder. But it can and does still happen. Yeah, well, it's good to know. Um, and then finally, the last question, which is really important, I hear this quite a bit. Um, if you haven't been vaccinated and you have survived COVID, is there natural immunity? Do you still need to get vaccinated? You absolutely still need to get vaccinated. There is natural immunity for some period of time, but the level varies from individual to individual. And we don't know how long it lasts. So, you know, it should not be used as an insurance policy against future infection because, um, it simply isn't. Um, so even though you may have had previous infection, you're advised to go ahead and get vaccinated. And the good news is that if you do so, uh, your level of antibodies seem to be much higher than people who have not had you know, prior infection who, who did get vaccinated. And so you're going to be kind of like super you know, um, immunized, if you will. You know, but the, the other thing I want to caution people is that, you know, we all get kind of fixated on antibody levels and, and that's kind of the, the currency that we think about in terms of are we protected or not. But, you know, the immune system is kind of a layered system. So we have antibodies and we have T cells. So, you know, there are people where we may see lower levels of antibodies, but they may still have a good T cell response. So I don't want us to get hung up. You know, many people ask, do I need to go out and get my antibody levels checked? To know if I'm protected or not. And do I, can I do that? And if I, if I do have antibodies, maybe I don't need to get, you know, vaccinated or maybe I don't need to get boosted if they're still, you know, there. And the, the reality there is we're still learning kind of what the appropriate level of antibodies is that confers protection. Um, and, and those levels vary. And I'm part of a large in National Cancer Institute funded study that's actually looking at um, antibody responses in patients with lung cancer specifically, again, because our community is so at risk. Um, so, you know, studies are underway to determine what kind of level you need to be protected. But absolutely, if you've had prior infection, you are still uh, strongly advised to get vaccinated. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Moore. Every time we talk, I learn something new. <laughs> I, I learn something new almost every day. I mean, it's a rapidly changing landscape and there's a lot of information. It's hard to keep pace. Um, so, you know, Upal and I and others in the lung cancer community came out of the gate early in 2020 trying to provide the information to our community just to help kind of sort through the sheer volume of, of information, it's confusing, it can be scary. So we wanted to be a resource to provide kind of curated um, information to keep our community safe, to make you, to help empower you to make those choices for yourself and your family, your loved ones to get us all through this pandemic. And hopefully if we do those things, then maybe 2022 will be the year that we can start to come out from under um, this dark cloud that's been over all of us for the last couple of years. So, you know, it, I'm encouraged, I you know, I think, um, you know, vaccines are, are helping and, and we know kind of how to treat COVID better than maybe we did initially. So we're, we're making headway, but we still have a little, little ways to go. So thank you all. You know where to find me, send me questions on social media if you like, and um, looking forward to Dr. Bassett Roy's presentation on the advances we're making in lung cancer research as well. So thank you. Thank you, Amy. Um, our next speaker is Dr. 
Dr. Bassaroy, and thank you for taking the time to be here. Um, if you're ready, you can feel free to share your screen and begin your presentation. He's on mute. Oh. I'm on mute, I apologize. Uh, thank you, Katie, for the, for the invitation to be a part of this discussion. Super, super thrilled to be here. And I see my old friends, Alyssa, Melissa, and uh, Ellen. Melissa, I'm sorry we didn't see each other last time you're in New York, but looking forward to seeing you next time. And uh, before I jump into my presentation, I wanted to actually piggyback on a point that Dr. Moore mentioned. So I'm a COVID survivor. I had COVID in March of 2020. I live in New York City, the epicenter of COVID of the pandemic in the US. And I was one of the first groups of people in New York to have COVID and I got it pretty bad. And then I got the vaccines after that and I'm also boosted. And I also had the same discussions that you were also going through in your head that I had COVID. Do I need to get vaccinated? And I can tell you it's an absolute, absolute must. Please get vaccinated. When I was sick, I was really sick. I had the vaccines. Yes, very inconvenient, but nothing compared to the actual disease. So please, please, please get vaccinated. Encourage your loved ones to get vaccinated. All right, with that, I will start sharing my screen. And let me know if you can see it. And today's discussion is talking about lung cancer progress, but really a celebration of progress. And I, I think that's the goal we want to have here. And before we get started, just to tell you a little bit about my background. So I trained as a page, I, I did my PhD research in cancer biology, and my research was focused on colon cancer research. And then I did my postdoctoral research in uh, cancer research as well. So I'm a trained cancer biologist, and I also have a background in public health. And my personal connection to lung cancer is the fact that I lost my uncle and my aunt to the disease. And had they been diagnosed today, I can tell you that their outcomes would have been very different. They were diagnosed at a point when we had not made the kind of progress that we see today. And that's actually the point that I want to drive home, that progress makes a huge difference. Research makes a huge, huge difference. And that's the only way we can actually celebrate survivorship. So to sort of uh, tell you a little bit more about what we as a foundation do, and then tell you a little bit about how we contribute and how we participate in research. And then, of course, uh, most of my talk will be focused on lung cancer progress. So we are a patient-driven organization and we are really about people diagnosed with lung cancer and for people diagnosed with lung cancer, including care partners and uh, loved ones of patients. And we as a foundation, we have evolved with time. You know, we were founded in 2011 and we've done a lot of great things in the past 20 years. And again, to sort of tell you a little bit about how we've sort of gone there, even just reflecting on what we were even 10 years ago, we were mostly an organization that provided support and we funded research and we raised awareness. And as you can see, with time, we've added all of these different pillars. And the reason why we feel that all of these different pillars, for example, education, support and survivorship, community building, then uh, policy, I think these have become incredibly important because at the end of the day, all of these collective actions, that's what leads to better outcomes for the lung cancer community. And today we are focused on two big goals at the foundation. One is improving outcomes for people diagnosed with lung cancer and then improving how people live with lung cancer. And how do we achieve our goals? This is just a very, very, very high level overview of what we as a foundation, we like the way we do uh, improving outcomes. We do a couple of different things here. We fund translational research. Then we are very involved with increasing access to different pieces of lung cancer care. And what do I mean by access? I mean access to lung cancer screening, access to clinical trials for lung cancer, and access to precision medicine. And precision medicine is going to be a huge piece of my talk today, how lung cancer has become the poster child of precision medicine. And of course, we have a data generation core, and I'll tell you a little bit at the end about why data is important in this space. And finally, we have a huge survivorship and support program. We have lots of patient education that Dr. Moore leads. But all this is to say that we have this very comprehensive package for people diagnosed with lung cancer and, of course, their loved ones and caregivers as well. Now, that brings me to sort of the bulk of my talk, which is lung cancer research and treatment. And this, as I mentioned, is a talk of celebration because 10 years ago, the talk would have been very different. 
But today we can talk about how research has made it possible that no patient is left behind. And that is essentially the goal of all of us doing this work. We want to make sure that every patient diagnosed with lung cancer has the best care possible. All right, so before we talk about all this progress, I want to sort of ground us in the journey. Now, I think all of you are very familiar with the journey of a patient, right? I think, as you can see, it's incredibly convoluted and there are lots of decisions that need to be made. There are lots of pieces in this entire diagnostic journey. And all this is to say that the journey is incredibly complex and it's very individual for each patient. I don't think anyone's journey is the same. Every patient has a unique journey. But the reason I bring this up is, yes, this is a journey from the patient perspective, but when you're talking about lung cancer treatment, this is how the journey looks like from a doctor's perspective. You're thinking about pre-diagnosis, which is risk factors. And we'll talk about each of those boxes, by the way. We'll talk about risk factors, low-dose CT. Then we have screening for lung cancer for certain patients. And when there is suspicion that a particular individual may have lung cancer, then we go into all of these diagnostic testings, imaging, uh, you may have heard of CT scans or PET scans or PET CT scans. Sometimes there might be a bone scan or a brain MRI. And then, of course, you'll have a biopsy. Now, a biopsy is a very critical piece of the diagnostic journey because a biopsy helps the pathologist, a type of doctor, to really decide if what is seen in that image is indeed lung cancer. Keep in mind that the lung area there are a lot of other organs in the lung space as well. You have lymph nodes and sometimes cancer develops in lymph nodes. And when you do an image, you can't make out is the cancer really in the lung or in the lymph nodes. So you have to do a biopsy where a piece of the cancer tissue is removed and the pathologist looks at it under the microscope to decide is it lung cancer or not. And if it is lung cancer, what type of lung cancer it is, which then gets into the molecular tests. And this information, the diagnostic information, that the doctor receives is used for treatment decision making. And the reason I bring this slide up is all of these things that you see, a bronchoscopy, a fine needle aspiration, a PET CD scan, these are immense advances in the diagnostic procedures of lung cancer. 30 years ago, we did not have these sophisticated procedures for diagnosing lung cancer. And all of this has made a huge, huge, huge impact on how we diagnose lung cancer today and of course, how we treat it. Now, again, what is lung cancer? I, again, I mentioned that, you know, the lung is a very organ-rich area. You have the heart, you have lymph nodes. So lung cancer is very specifically any kind of cancer that arises in the lungs or, or adjacent structures and very specific. So it could be the trachea, the bronchus, and of course, within the lung. And it is the second most common cancer in men and women. Now, how does lung cancer develop? Now, I'm sure... The word uh, tobacco exposure, smoking, I think all of us know that it's associated with lung cancer. But I do, do, do want to remind all of you that, that tobacco smoking and tobacco exposure is not the only risk factor. It is the most well-studied risk factor. We know the most about tobacco exposure. We know the most about active smoking, but it is not the only risk factor. So essentially, how does lung cancer develop? It develops where the lung tissue interacts with risk factors. And we will talk a little bit about risk factors in a second. And that leads to changes in the lungs where the normal DNA of lung cells get mutated. And these mutations then make the cells grow faster. And this leads to lung cancer development. Again, if there's one message that I want you to take away from this slide, it is that tobacco exposure is not the only risk factor of lung cancer. It is the most well-studied one. Now, let's really discuss risk factors. And again, we know a lot about tobacco exposure, but there are lots of other risk factors. And some of them we don't talk a lot about. Social determinants of health, where someone lives, the geography of the patient makes a difference. If the individual is in a highly polluted region, yes, there is a much higher risk of developing lung cancer. I come from India, and India has some of the most polluted cities in the world. And in these polluted cities, the rate of lung cancer has been increasing with time as the rate of pollution has been increasing. So we do know that geography matters. And lower SES, a lower socioeconomic status, we do know that individuals with lower SES, they have a much higher likelihood of developing lung cancer for the simple reason that they may not have access to healthy eating. They may be living in areas, again, in geographies that have high pollution levels. 
Now, environmental factors, again, hugely important. We know about this gas called radon. Radon is a colorless, odorless gas. It is a carcinogen or a cancer-causing agent, and it actually is released from the earth and in the in asbestos. Now, asbestos is an occupational hazard and leads to lung cancer. And then finally, we have a lot of individual level factors. We know about tobacco exposure, but genetics plays a role. And the role of genetics in lung cancer, we are, we are learning more and more about it. Age, diet, age, huge risk factor. Age is actually a risk factor for all cancers. The older we live, the chances of us developing cancer just increases. Now, certain lung diseases may increase our risk of lung cancer. For example, if you have COPD, much higher risk of lung cancer. And then if you've had a prior cancer, now what do I mean by that? I did mention that the lung is a very organ-rich area and you have lymph nodes. And certain types of cancers called lymphomas can develop in those lymph nodes. And if you've developed or if you had a lymphoma as, as a child or as a young adult, one of the treatments for lymphoma is radiation. So if you've received radiation in that area, the chances of developing lung cancer in that same area is much higher. Now let's talk a little bit about radon. Radon is a huge risk factor for lung cancer. And I, the reason I bring this up, and especially from a United States perspective, you see a map of the US with high radon levels. The more red you see on that map, that means it's got higher radon levels. Radon, at least in the United States, can be mitigated. And the, the, the Environmental Protection Agency and the website is right, the epa.gov, they will actually send you a free kit to test if radon is a problem in the area that you live. So if this is something that you're concerned about, please feel free to check out the EPA website because radon continues to be a huge risk factor. And the reason I bring radon up is because it's colorless and it doesn't have a smell. So if you're being exposed to radon, you don't know that you're going through that exposure. All right, let's discuss lung cancer screening. And I know this is top of mind for everyone because what is lung cancer screening? Or I should say, what is cancer screening? Any kind of cancer screening is a, is, is, is a procedure where we are able to catch the cancer when it's really small in size. So we can use surgery. It could be breast cancer, colon cancer, lung cancer, where we can use surgery to offer the potential of cure because the cancer hasn't spread and before symptoms develop. Now, most of the times, if the cancer has grown in size, that means there will be some symptoms. So the goal of lung cancer screening is to catch the cancer in its smallest stage, in its earliest stage, before any symptoms develop. Keep in mind that as soon as symptoms develop, then screening doesn't really help, right? The goal here is to catch the cancer before screening develops. And again, with the goal of offering surgery as a cure. Keep in mind that screening was not available 10 years ago. And this is hugely important. I mentioned my uncle who was diagnosed in 2004. He would have qualified for lung cancer screening at this point of time. But when he was diagnosed, we did not have lung cancer screening. Now, who should get lung cancer screening? I think this is, an, this is very, very important to keep in mind that there are specific criteria and you have to meet these criteria for lung cancer screening. You have to have a history of tobacco exposure or you need to be a current smoker and you need to fit the age criteria. And below you see how pack years are calculated. You need to have a 20 year pack history or more. Uh, you should be a current or a former smoker and quit 15 years before and uh, between this age group. Now, the reason why lung cancer screening is offered to this age group and these criteria is because we know the most about this group of people. It is not that lung cancer screening does not work in other groups. It's just that we do not know if the benefits of lung cancer screening is enough in other groups of people. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, actually, before I go into the benefits, what happens during lung cancer screening, you go through a CT scan and it's called low density CT screening. And then you can have a couple of different outcomes when you go through lung cancer screening. Either the first outcome is, you know, you have a clean scan, so your lungs are absolutely clean or you have a small nodule. And these are not cancer, right? The small nodules are not cancer, but whether you have a clean scan or a small nodule, the key thing here is you have to come back for uh, further scans. And this is incredibly important that the first scan that you have through a lung cancer screening typically will not catch the cancers. You need to come back. It's like going for your annual uh, pap smears or your mammograms or your colonoscopies. 
any kind of screening, you have to continue to do screening so that you get the benefit. Or of course, you can catch early lung cancer. Now, I mentioned in, my, in, in one of my previous slides that lung cancer screening for those group of people where those risk factors of smoking are not met. Now, what I'm showing you here is essentially all those individuals who qualify for lung cancer screening. So essentially a uh, 20 pack year or more of uh, smoking, a uh, pack year of uh, smoking history or more, anyone who's quit 15 years or less, and you have to be a former or, uh, or current smoker and the ages of 50 to 80. So this, this graph that you're seeing here is specifically for that group of people. Now, if hundred, if, if thousand such uh, patients are screened, uh, sorry, individuals are screened, then we will detect three lung cancers at the end, which is what you see at the end here, the three orange, which is incredibly important. So that tells us that you need to screen thousand people to get three lung cancers and keep that in mind. But also keep in mind that all of these other procedures, the invasive procedures, because sometimes you will see a nodule in the lung, but you don't know what it is. And so you'll have to do a biopsy. And the same thing here, sometimes you catch cancers which are actually harmless and which will not grow. So all this is to say that, yes, you have uh, caught three ca cancers and you've saved three lives, but you've also made 17 people go through additional procedures. Now, this is within this category of people. Now, if we expand screening to sort of the general population, we may expand this. We may catch more cancers, but the bigger problem is we also increase this group where more number of people will have to go through these invasive procedures and we will catch things like cancers which don't grow and we will act upon them. But in, in reality, those cancers did not need to be followed up. So all this is to say the reason why lung cancer screening is not offered to everyone is because the risks are probably much more than the harms. But in this population, the screen eligible population, the benefits of catching the cancer is much more than the risks. So that is the reason why lung cancer screening is not available to the general population. Now, what about other screening technologies? And this is, this is very, very exciting for scientists like Amy and me. And we are thrilled that, that this, this technology is progressing in the clinic. And these are called multi-cancer early detection tests. Now we talked about lung cancer screening. You have a low density, a low dose CT screening and you catch lung cancer. Then you can have a mammogram for breast cancer. You can have a colonoscopy for colon cancer. So these are all one test, one cancer approach. Now, what are these multi-cancer early detection tests? These are very simple blood tests that can actually test for a whole group of cancers. And the example that I'm showing here is one such test where you do a blood test and not only will it catch these five cancers, and these five cancers have been bolded because these are the five cancers that have screening. For breast, you have uh, mammograms. For lung, you have LDCT. For colon cancer, you have colonoscopies. For prostate cancer, you have digital rectal exam. And for cervical cancer, you have pap smears. So these are the five cancers that we screen for now. But with these multi-cancer early detection tests, we call them one test, many cancers, or one-stop shop. With a blood test, you can catch all these cancers. Now, the reason why we can even do this is because all cancers share some common characteristics which you can catch in the blood test. Now, obviously, keep in mind that when these tests come, in, these tests are still not ready to come out uh, to, to, to still be used in, in the clinic because we are still going through clinical trials. But keep in mind that along with these tests, we will still need to have those imaging because these tests will tell you what type of cancer it is, but we still need to make sure that we do the scan to actually locate the cancer. And again, the goal of these multi-cancer tests is to do these blood tests before there are symptoms. Again, to catch it before there are symptoms, when the cancer is small in size, so we can offer surgery as a cure. All right, let's talk about lung cancer diagnosis. And this is this is, this is the most exciting piece in my mind. And again, in the 1970s, we sort of looked at lung cancer as one collective disease. We didn't see it much differently. And that's because our ability to sort of see these finer nuances was much more limited. But fast forward to 2021, we see that that big pie of lung cancer, we've sort of divided up into these buckets. Non-small cell lung cancer is the biggest bucket followed by small cell lung cancer. And these buckets are very, very important because based on what type of lung cancer a patient has, the doctor can decide the treatment. So keep in mind that this pie chart helps the doctor decide what treatment someone will get. 
Before the spike chart, everyone got the same treatment, but thanks to our understanding, patients get different treatments based on what type of lung cancer they have. And this is even more refined now. And the reason why I say it's even more refined is because these cancers occur in different parts of the lungs. Now, the three main cancers that I talked about, adenocarcinoma, squamous cell lung cancer, small cell lung cancer, they look very different under the microscope. So a pathology can look at them and say, okay, this is small cell, this is adeno, this is squamous, but they occur in different parts of the lungs. So small cell and squamous cell are associated with tobacco exposure. So they tend to happen very close to where the smoke exposure happens, which is on the trachea or closer to the bronchioles. And adenocarcinoma, on the other hand, tends to be more embedded in the lungs. Now, there are adenocarcinomas that are associated with tobacco exposure, but all this is to say that small cell and squamous, the correlation is very, very clear. Now, I mentioned about the type of lung cancer, non-small cell, small cell. We actually go even deeper now and we divide that the big pie into even smaller pies. And that's where biomarkers come in. And we'll talk in a minute about what biomarkers are. And let's just talk about lung adenocarcinoma with this big slice of the pie in the previous graph. Now, today, lung adenocarcinoma, we know that about 50% of lung adenocarcinoma have different biomarkers. And what you see on the right is that list of biomarkers. And that dotted line that you see, KRAS G12C, and then all the way to ROS1. So about 50% of lung adenocarcinoma today have a biomarker, which helps the doctor decide a treatment. So keep that in mind. 50% of adenocarcinomas, a type of lung cancer, have a biomarker that the doctor can use to treat. Now let's look at the left side and how this has happened, how our understanding of biomarkers has increased the time. From say about 1984 to 2003, the only biomarker we knew in lung cancer was KERAS. So it's the oldest biomarker we knew about lung cancer, but we did not have a treatment for KERAS till actually 2021. And then we've sort of added our understanding, we have added to our understanding of biomarkers with time. And this understanding of biomarkers was possible because of projects such as the Cancer Genome Atlas. And the reason I bring up the Cancer Genome Atlas and the Human Genome Atlas is because of the fact that these research projects really helped us understand about lung cancer as a, as a disease and that lung cancer is not one disease, but in fact, it's incredibly complex. And this information can be used to decide treatment. Now, what is biomarker testing and how does it work? Now, biomarkers are specific molecules that are found in your cancer that can tell the doctor whether treatment A or treatment B will work. Now, how does biomarker testing work? Typically, what happens is a sample is taken from the patient and the sample could be a piece of the cancer tissue through a biopsy, or it could be a blood sample and then it's analyzed through tests called NGS or next, uh, next gen sequencing. And based on the type of biomarker, the doctor is able to prescribe a particular therapy, very, very customized to the patient. Now, this is what the landscape of adenocarcinoma looks like today based on all those biomarkers. So I just want you to focus on those green columns. Those are nine different biomarkers that we know exist in lung cancer. Each of those biomarkers has a specific treatment associated with it. This was unthinkable 10 years ago. And what you see in yellow in between, it's called HER2. The reason I bring that up is HER2 is the 10th biomarker that's soon going to have a drug. Now you see there something called trastuzumab, derexican. That's a target. That's a very specific therapy for HER2 driven lung cancer. So again, and it's in clinical trials. So very important to keep in mind that this is the next biomarker that you've probably seen approval for. Now let's look at the orange side. Now on the, on the left, in the green and the yellow, yes, cancers are biomarkers and we have treatments. Now I also mentioned that there are 50% of adenocarcinoma patients who don't have biomarkers, but they have something else called PDL1. The cancers express this protein called PDL1, which is a biomarker for immunotherapy. And based on how much PDL1 the cancer produces, and I have the numbers there, 
there are specific immunotherapies. And keep in mind that it's not just one immunotherapy, there are different immunotherapies. So immunotherapy is also becoming very personalized. And the reason I bring that up is it's very important to take into account patient preferences when you're thinking of immunotherapy. Now, certain immunotherapies can be combined with chemotherapy and certain immunotherapies are just combination immunotherapies. So maybe a patient doesn't want a particular chemotherapy immunotherapy and they might just want immunotherapy. So there's an option for them. So all these immunotherapy options are very important because they help us take into account patient preferences. Now, yes, biomarkers, drugs, but our understanding has actually gone even more than just biomarkers and drugs. So we have one biomarker, one drug, we are actually able to use all of this biomarker information to even understand how tumors, how cancers behave. We can understand which cancers will be more metastatic, which cancers will spread faster, which cancers will start growing despite uh, targeted therapies. And I know that this particular slide is very busy, but what I do want to point out here is look at this blue slice. EGFR is one of those groups of biomarkers. Now, based on whether EGFR plus another mutation, for example, TP53 or RB1, based on if there are other biomarkers in the cancer, the doctor is able to decide what type of treatment is necessary for the patient because each of these cancers will behave very, very differently. So personalization at its peak. And this is where we are with all of our understanding of lung cancer. This is how the treatment landscape looks like. Now you can see from 1998 to about 2010, we had very few biomarker-driven treatments. Now, as time has progressed, you can see that the number of biomarker-driven treatments has just increased. And again, I just want to give you a little bit of historical context. This is 2007 is around all of the sequencing projects started. So you can see that research started here and the impact of research started being seen here very clearly. So research makes a huge difference. And all the yellow bars that you see there, possible only because of research, only because of the commitment of our doctors, our scientists to drive this change and for clinical trials. Now, let's talk about liquid biopsies. Again, incredibly, incredibly exciting. Now, what is a liquid biopsy? A liquid biopsy is not a tissue biopsy. You know, we talked about biopsies earlier on, right? Taking a, lung, a piece of lung tissue. And what you see on the right, on the left side is a tissue biopsy. It's the very traditional biopsy. You can, and here what you see is, uh, is a bronchoscope going in to sample this little blue piece here, which is the lung tumor. And you need a lot of skilled staff. And, you know, sometimes uh, a, a tissue biopsy can lead to uh, uh, lead to complications, for example, a collapsed lung. Now, what you see on the right side is a liquid biopsy, and a liquid biopsy typically happens through a blood. You can also use fluid drawn from, uh, from pleural fluid, which is sometimes drawn through a process called uh, thoracocentesis, but more often than ever, it's the blood draw that's used for liquid biopsies. And why is it important? It's incredibly important because you have skipped this tissue biopsy, right? You are not putting a patient through another biopsy very helpful. Also, results from liquid biopsy can come much faster than that of a tissue biopsy. But most importantly, I think it's, it's, it's for me at least, it's really saving a patient that extra biopsy that you might have to go through. And this liquid biopsy piece is very important. Both are the time of diagnosis. So when a patient is diagnosed with lung cancer, typically the tissue biopsy will happen. As I mentioned, you have to look at the cells under the microscope. But nowadays, doctors will start with a liquid biopsy because the results of the liquid biopsies tend to come faster. And all of these biomarkers that we talked about here, most of these biomarkers can now be detected in a liquid biopsy as well. So thereby making it really efficient and easy. Now, one thing to keep in mind is not all the times liquid biopsies are positive. So sometimes a liquid biopsy will not give us any information. So at that point, we have to do a tissue biopsy because we need as much information as possible. So a negative liquid biopsy means the tissue biopsy may be needed. A negative liquid biopsy does not mean that there are no biomarkers. Most of the times it means that you might have to do a liquid biopsy. Now, if your liquid biopsy and a tissue biopsy is negative, then yes, probably no biomarkers. So to summarize where we are in lung cancer treatment, huge, huge, huge amount of progress. Now, surgery and radiation are the oldest cancer treatments in general, not just for lung cancer. Surgery and radiation have been around for a long time. Surgery is one of the oldest 
treatments offered to cancer patients followed by radiation. But as you see with time, we've done a very good job of, uh, of progress in, and adding different treatment modalities. Now, let's talk small cell lung cancer. And this is a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. Small cell lung cancer, again, I'm gonna go back really quickly here. It's this slice of the pie, it's 13%. It's a small slice of the lung cancer pie, but small cell lung cancer is very important because for a long time, we had not seen progress in this disease. And because patients didn't live for a very long time and we didn't have mechanisms to study the disease. But in 2013, the government of the United States passed an act called the Recalcitrant Cancer Act. And the Recalcitrant Cancer Act was very important because it pushed researchers, it, it, it allocated funding to study those cancers where we've not seen a lot of progress and small cell was one of them. And as soon as the Recalcitrant Ca uh, Cancer Act hit and we had funding for small cell lung cancer research, we started seeing a lot of progress. Now, this particular piece is actually very important to me personally because we always think of small cell lung cancer as a disease that's associated with tobacco exposure. Yes, it is. But the reason I flag this is this was a presentation that happened this year at the World Conference on Lung Cancer, which says that small cell lung cancer may have a hereditary component. Very, very important. And what you see here in the orange is just telling us that if you have, if you have more, if you have many first degree relatives with a family history of cancer, then the chances of you getting, then the, the chances of you getting small cell is high. If you have more relatives with specifically lung cancer, the chances are even higher. And this is important to keep in mind that family history decides if you may get small cell lung cancer. And this was something that was unheard of because every time we thought of small cell, everyone just assumed smoking, smoking, smoking. Yes, important, but let's also not minimize all of these other components that go towards it. And what's even more incredible is in that particular study, the researchers were able to sequence this hereditary cancers, and then they were able to come up with a treatment. And in this case, they found out that the patient with the small cell lung cancer, they had a mutation in a gene called GRIP1, and germline means it's inherited. So a germline mutation means that it's a mutation that go from parent to children. Most lung cancers are not caused by germline mutations. But in this case, in the study, they detected germline mutations with small cell and then they treated this patient with a specific drug targeting BRIP1. And you can see this white spot here and, and the scan here, and this is the PET image. They disappear with this targeted therapy. So again, small cell lung cancer is getting personalized. And this was unimaginable. And lastly, let's talk about palliative care. It's something we don't talk a lot about in lung cancer, but palliative care is very, 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 very helpful. And typically palliative care discussions happen towards, you know, when, when, when a patient is feeling really sick and then a doctor talks about palliative care and says, okay, let's talk about palliative care because it's going to help you manage your symptoms. I say, no, let's have the discussion about palliative care at the time of diagnosis and you get to know your palliative care team. And it's going to be very helpful because it helps you address symptoms of the disease, coughing, coping, pain, Pain control is a huge piece of palliative care. So palliative care is very, very important. And again, we've made a tremendous amount of progress in palliative care over the past 10 years. And last but not least, since lung cancer is such a complex disease, patients typically will not have one doctor treating lung cancer. You typically work with a team of doctors. You have your medical oncologist, then you have nurses, the radiation oncologist who decides the radiation pathway. Then the nuclear medicine specialist is very important because they decide what dosage of radiation you need. The pulmonologist is the lung doctor. Then you have the radiologist who does all the scans. And then you have a palliative care specialist and some patients may have a thoracic surgeon and the pathologist. Again, reminding everyone that the care team of lung cancer is very complex because lung cancer is a complex disease. So lots of progress to celebrate. We can screen for lung cancer now, something we can do 10 years ago. We have treatments for lots of different types of lung cancer and palliative care has become so much more sophisticated. So encourage all doctors and patients to have discussions on palliative care as soon as they're diagnosed because it makes the going through the journey so much easier. And again, I'm going to put in a little plug for a study from longevity. So I talked about the journey from a patient perspective, 
we are the foundation. We are very, very, very interested in learning how a patient or a loved one goes through the lung cancer journey. Because again, if I go back to this particular slide, it's not a one and done. You get diagnosed, sometimes you get a treatment and the treatment works for some time and then you go on to another treatment. So there's an ebb and flow. And we want to understand what you're going through during these ebb and flow. So this particular study project here is really for us as a foundation to understand what's happening during one year so we can better support you. And if you're interested in participating in the study, please uh, check out this website. And of course, my email address is right there. Send me an email. Happy to talk about the study and of course, anything related to this presentation. And so with that, I'm going to end. And essentially, this is our vision as longevity. We want to have a world of thriving survivors. And this is why we do what we do. And again, Katie, thank you so much for inviting me for this discussion. Thank you, Dr. Upal. We have a few questions. Do you mind answering a couple before you go? Absolutely. Okay, so one in the chat says, I have um, adenocarcinoma with mucinous features. Does mucinous adenocarcinoma treated differently than without mucinous features? Does that make that, sense? That's a, very, that's a very good question, Rachel. And as of now, uh, adenocarcinoma is treated in the same way as mucinous adenocarcinoma. And I mentioned the biomarkers. So if you're diagnosed with any type of adenocarcinoma, mucinous or not, the treatment is going to be the same and the treatment is going to be decided by the biomarker that the cancer has. Okay, next question is about screening. Um, is there any work going into um, expanding screening to other high-risk groups? That's a very, very, very good question. And I uh, for in the interest of time and in sort of going to the details of expanding the criteria of screening. Now, uh, the USPSTF or the United States uh, Preventative Services Task Force, they are, they are sort of the public health body who decide all types of screening, whether it's lung, colon, and breast. Now, the USPSTF has decided that LDCT is applicable only to that group of patients who have tobacco exposure between the age of 50 to 80. But there is a lot of research that's going on, which is, which is aiming to expand the criteria. And when I say expand the criteria, if there is a group of individuals who have a lower history of tobacco exposure, keep in mind that the tobacco exposure is, is stringent, they're 20 pack year or more and quit 15 years or less. Now there are other groups that are looking at the same criteria, but less stringent if there are additional risk factors. For example, if you quit smoking 25 years ago, you don't need the USPSTF criteria but you quit smoking 25 years ago, but there is a family history of lung cancer. Yes, so all of these different studies are looking at expanding lung cancer screening to this broader group. Perfect. Okay, lots of questions for you. <laughs> um, are there any options or treatments being looked at for people with early stage non-small cell lung cancer who have nodules or ground glass, um, uh, GGOs, in their lungs still, but no mutations and zero PDL1? That's a very good question. And GGOs is, is, is still an area of intense investigations because some GGOs can be cancerous and some GGOs can just stay the way they are, which is what I was referring to in, in the screening graph that sometimes you know, you'll biopsy a GGO or you'll take out a GGO, but that GGO is gonna just stay and not grow at all. So the, 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 this, this, uh, the, the area of GGOs and how to treat GGOs is still, uh, still an area that, that doctors are figuring out which GGOs need to be treated and which GGOs can stay for lack of better words. And that's where there's a lot of work on biomarkers and if we can decide which GGOs need to come out. Now, going back to the broader question of early stage lung cancer, typically a surgery was offered and sometimes patients got chemotherapy before or after the surgery and sometimes radiation was offered. But that's actually really changing again all of those biomarkers and all of those immunotherapies that I talked about in, uh, and that was mostly in advanced stage lung cancer, all of that is actually coming into early stage lung cancer where patients are being given immunotherapy before surgery, patients are being given immunotherapy after surgery. And the goal of, uh, of these treatments in early stage lung cancer is to make sure the cancer does not come back. So keep in mind that in early stage lung cancer, you're going through surgery, right? So the assumption is you've been cured. But very often the cancer does come back. So in most, in about 50% of patients, 
surgery plus chemotherapy, the cancer still comes back. So adding immunotherapy or adding one of those other biomarker-driven therapies that we talked about brings down that risk even more. So all of those drugs are coming into early stage disease. So to summarize, lots of progress and lots to be hopeful for. Absolutely. Um, can you answer any questions about if there are research regarding vaping or e-cigarettes in lung cancer? Is there a higher risk there that you know of? That's an excellent question. Now let's talk a little bit about how we even learned about cigarette smoking and lung cancer. These were long-term studies. These were 10, 15 year studies that were conducted. And based on how lung cancer was developing in, 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 in people who have been exposed to cigarette smoke, we made that correlation that smoking leads to lung cancer. Now, the same types of studies have not been conducted with vaping and with e-cigarettes, only because these tools have been around for a very short period of time. So we've not had the opportunity to follow these groups of people for the same amount of time that we could have, with, that we were able to do with cigarettes. But having said that, it is becoming very, very clear that e-cigarettes, vaping, they have the same types of injury. They're they causing the same types of changes in the lung tissue. They're causing the same types of injury in the lung tissue. So the assumption is that they will be as harmful as cigarette smoking. So again, is there science? Not really, but that's just a matter of time. The more we have these around, the more we learn. But based on past experience, there's a very high likelihood that e-cigarettes and vaping will be associated with increased development of lung cancer. That's so good to know. Thank you so much. And thank you for asking, <laughs> answering all those questions in such a short time. My pleasure. Thank you. So we are going to go right into our next session. Thank you so much, Dr. Basuroy. The next session, we'd like to discuss living with lung cancer through the challenges of a pandemic during the holidays and ways that we can get support and support others. Um, we'll be joined by our colleagues at Cancer Pathways, as well as survivorship nurse navigator Christy Griffith and Carol Levin. Levin Fedwa. I hope I said that right. I'm going to get it by the end of this program. Um, Carol is an expert in lung cancer because she's living with lung cancer, and I cannot wait for her to share her story. Carol, please tell us your story. Hi, everyone. I'm really pleased to be here. Uh, do I have to share my screen? No, only if you okay. have. <laughs> okay. I'm pretty new at this. Um, I'm really pleased to be here with um, all of these experts. I, I, I say thank you to calling me an expert, but I don't know that I'm an expert. I'm just experiencing a journey that um, some of us are experiencing as well. Uh, uh, I guess I should start off just giving you a little background. Uh, I was diagnosed with lung cancer in uh, July of 2017. Originally, it was 3B is the target, is the um, staging, and but then it quickly went into um, stage four. And how it did that was um, I they found some lymph nodes that were also cancerous. So it quickly went to stage four. Uh, long story short, I've been through pretty much most of the treatments that are uh, used typically, except for immunotherapy. I've had chemo, radiation, uh, lobectomy, chemo, radiation, <laughs> and uh, I've also had targeted therapy. I'm currently on Tegriso. I've been on Tegriso since 20, uh, the end of 2019, and I did have progression after 14 months, uh, of course, and that was probably one of the di most difficult times for me because I had to make some deci a decision. 
And I had one oncologist that wanted me to include immunotherapy. And so I went and got a second opinion, which I think I'm really glad that I did that. Uh, it, it verified, if nothing else, it verified that my oncologist was on the same path as the second opinion. And that really made me feel comfortable. Uh, the oncologist for the second opinion, he didn't think I necessarily needed the immunotherapy and that maybe save it for later, you know, as something, you know, something in your pocket for later on. So I went without the immunotherapy because I have a very, I have less than 1% of the PDL1. And, you know, I've done enough, I did enough reading to know that when you have very low PDL1 immunotherapy, the results are not very good. Uh, so we moved on and from the progression, I, uh, went without the uh, immunotherapy, but I did do chemo and um, I continued to take Tegriso while I was doing the chemo. And the reason why for that was because I had read about the blood brain barrier and, uh, and how I, I read quite a bit on in, online about that. Uh, and really felt that that was important for me because if it, if it had, um, well, I don't have any brain metastases. I hope I never have any brain metastases, but I know that, that, that there are things to do about that too, if it does come to that. But uh, I just wanted to test out this brain blood barrier is really what I wanted to find out about. So far, so good. Uh, I have experienced enormous pain, like pain you just never want to see someone in when I relapsed and the uh, cancer came back and I felt like nobody believed me, you know, or was listening to me. And then finally someone did and you know, I was in the hospital and they had me starting at 80, 80 milligrams of oxy. So I was on heavy duty drugs for a long time. Uh, eventually it, you know, I got down to where I was able to not have to take them. Uh, so I went from 80 to 60 to 40 to 20 and just weaned myself down. Uh, since then, I have continued on to Griso. I did have, uh, I am now finishing up the second round of chemo. Uh, I was getting Avastin and um, Carboplatin and uh, Olympta. And I was really having difficulties with my blood uh, tests. And so we cut out the Olympta and the Carboplatin. And now I just get the um, Avastin as maintenance. So I finished the, that round of the three types of drugs and and I'm now on maintenance and I just finished up my second round of maintenance and uh, I have now had three CTs that have come up stable. That's the first time I've ever had that. I am celebrating about that because historically, and I know it's only been a couple of years, I would have uh, the first scan would be stable and then the second scan would be stable and then the third one it came back so i'm moving forward which is the way i have to do it <laughs> so i've been through you know a, a lot of the same things that everybody else has been through uh before covid you know i felt pretty isolated and uh i felt you know like i 
wasn't, you know, seeing people. I wasn't talking to people because, you know, I was immunotherapy, immunocompromised. And so I had to be very careful about who came in the house. And, you know, when I was going through um, chemo and when I started on to Greece, so I, we put together a schedule and people would come every day to help, you know, someone different and, um, and that was fine. It worked out perfect. But then when COVID came, you know, it was like, well, now what am I going to do? Um, luckily, I was not on any hardcore treatment. So I, that didn't really affect me very much. Um, but what did really affect me was the lack of connection and the lack of communicating with people. Uh, that and I had stopped working as well uh, quite a while before COVID, so I didn't really have anybody. You know, around my husband was working out of the home, but then when COVID hit, you know, he was home, but he's working, and so my world got you know smaller and smaller, and it's very very difficult. You know, I have a dog. I had a dog, so she kept me company. Um, and yes, you have a phone and you can text people, but it just isn't the same as seeing people in person, you know, and, and even from six feet apart, I would rather have that than, you know, um, not seeing anybody. And I live here in Seattle, uh, Washington, outside of Seattle, Washington. And I was so grateful when I found longevity and cancer pathways because that opened up a whole other media uh, medium for me to, you know, share and listen and learn about lung cancer and learn that there's other people out there with lung cancer that need just as much support, you know, as I did. So I didn't feel as much alone. And I looked forward to you know, every Zoom that we had and to see people and talk to people and um, get to know them, you know, and uh, follow their stories, just like they were following mine. So it was that was really, really helpful, uh, because I'm a real, I'm a very much a people person. And, you know, just not being able to connect uh, with people, you know, before the cancer, yes, you know, I, I had to hunker down somewhat, but I knew that there was a time that I'd be able to get out. I just knew it. I'm a glass uh, half full kind of girl, or even three quarters of the way full. So I knew eventually I'd get out, but then COVID came along and it was like, okay, now everybody that hasn't been um, isolated and hasn't had to stay home. Now you come and join me, you know, hump on my, uh, jump on my bandwagon, because now you know what it feels like. <laughs> so I didn't feel so bad then because everybody else had to do it, you know. Uh, Carol, what, what advice would you give to a newly diagnosed lung cancer patient? From your experience, you know, what would you say to someone who was newly diagnosed? Well, my first thing I would say is breathe. Definitely breathe. Um, I think that's really important. Um, if maybe look into getting a therapist because you're gonna go through a lot of ups and downs and a lot of emotions are going to come out that maybe you didn't even realize were there. I know that happened for me and it was like three months into it. And I was like, my head's just spinning. I, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do about my job. I don't know what to do about my family. You know, is it, will I ever be able to, you know, what's going to happen? Am I going to die? You know, like all those questions and feelings that you have is so overwhelming. And having a therapist really helped me to just kind of break things down and, you know, put things in buckets and, you know, and work through them. And I still see her to this day. Uh, so I would say breathe. 
do some reading. I wouldn't go overboard because the internet is filled with so much stuff. You know, um, I did do that and then I finally stopped. I said, that's enough. <laughs> So, um, but I was able to learn some language, which really helped. So when my uh, oncologist or the radiologist or the, sur the uh, thoracic surgeon would mention something, I knew what those, you know, buzzwords were and I understood them. So that was very helpful. But um, I would say also get right on this longevity, you know, come to the Zoom meetings for longevity and for cancer pathways. Cancer pathways, for people who don't know, we have Zoom meeting two for lung cancer. And, um, you know, you talk about all kinds of things. It doesn't even have to be about lung cancer, um, but it is a safe place where you can talk about your you know, what's going on in your life. And uh, you do learn quite a bit from others. And one of the things that I did learn was questions to ask my oncologist. You know, what about this? And what about that? And, you know, I don't know if it's because you're all, you know, a lot of people in longevity are East Coast and we're on the West Coast. So it's different, you know, but some things my oncologist knew about and some things he didn't, you know, and I was teaching him. <laughs> so, um, you know, and the next thing is, which I think is so important is to create uh, people around you that are going to help you. You must have a village. You will not be able to get through it without a village. And I have had a very hard time in the beginning asking for help. But those people that helped me were on my case constantly. Carol, you need help. I'm going to do this, you know. And thank goodness, you know, and the second time around after, uh, you know, when it came around the second time, I didn't have any problem asking anybody anything. <laughs> so it really helped, you know, it really built my confidence because the having the lung cancer took some of my confidence away. You know, I had to leave my job and now, you know, just your life just changes overnight. And um, you got to work on all these things and it's overwhelming all the drugs you have to take and the language and, uh, and so thank goodness to, you know, both cancer pathways and longevity, because it gives you a place to learn about these things that are being told to you and thrown at you, even. Um, fortunately, I don't know if it's fortunately or unfortunately, I'm the kind of person that I just move forward. I just go forward. I don't kind of look back. As a matter of fact, I was trying to come up with a timetable for this event. And I had a little bit of one. I was trying to come up with another one. I'm like, this doesn't make sense. This date doesn't make sense. Wait, was this then? And what, you know, and I'm just, you know, I just go forward. I don't really, you know, when they tell me, oh, you have to, you know, have this treatment next, I go, okay, when are we starting, you know, and just move forward. So um, it is very scary, though, you know, it is scary. I don't want to minimalize, you know, anything about it. But um, breathing, meditation, yoga, you know, just give yourself five minutes even, you know, to just sit quietly. And because we don't realize that this really affects the rest of your body. Mm -hmm. And when you are on chemo, especially because the chemo, you know, it, it just destroys a lot of things in your, your body. And, um, you know, you have to do things to combat that. Yeah. Take care of your whole self. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's hard to do that. It, it is not easy at all. So that's why you need um, a community around you yeah. to stay on you and say, well, you know, did you do your yoga today? <laughs> you know, and I had people like that, you know, what did you eat today? 
Yeah. You know, what do you have for lunch? You know, yeah. they call me and ask me, you know, or, you know, if they're over here, okay, Carol, you got to eat something. Well, I'm not hungry. You know, I don't feel like it. Um, you're going to eat something. Right. You know? Right. And because you go through moments like that. Absolutely. Well, yeah. Carol, at this time, we're going to loop in Christy. Right. Um, Christy. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. So much care don't go away stay there <laughs> i won't i'm not going anywhere miss christy griffith she is a nurse navigator with over 30 years of oncology and palliative care experience christy serves as the first point of contact for patients and families who reach out to the foundation for support and she delivers patient support and comprehensive disease information to lung cancer patients and their families if you attend our meetups weekly then you already know christy christy thank you for joining us Thank you, Katie, and our friends at Cancer Pathways for having us this afternoon. What a wonderful program. And Carol, yes, you are amazing. Thank you for sharing your story with us all today. Absolutely. Well, you're welcome. I am amazing. <laughs> she is. Yes, you are. <laughs> So Christy, I have to ask you, what have been some of the challenges lung cancer patients have faced during the pandemic? What are you hearing in, in the support groups and from the patients? Oh, goodness. The isolation. As if life with lung cancer isn't difficult enough. You add a, a pandemic going on two years now. Um, the isolation um, not being able, and we've touched on this earlier in the call today, not being able to, to be with our family, our friends, our village, our people. Uh, that, I think, is, is one of the most difficult things that, um, that the pandemic has, has brought on. Also, anxiety. Um, you know, when it's hard anyway, but when you're a cancer patient and you're immune compromised, uh, the fear, the fear of the unknown. And, you know, new variants are coming out. Delta, Omicron, o Omicron now. I always say Omicron, it's Omicron. Keep myself straight. Um, the fear of the unknown, what that generates. The other, uh, the third thing is the conflict. Um, the struggle is real. And we actually, uh, our virtual meetups uh, are full of amazing survivors. Uh, like Carol, who is amazing. We, we confirmed that today. And to, in today's meetup earlier this afternoon, we spoke about the conflict that has been generated and it's common within all of our families and our circles, whether you're pro-vax, anti-vax, people have different opinions. And so having to manage that additional conflict uh, in addition to the stress and anxiety of a cancer diagnosis is a real challenge for a lot of survivors. So have you heard about things that help to alleviate some of their anxiety, stress, and fears during this time? It puts you right on the spot. <laughs> Hot seat. Katie, that's a fantastic question. Um, I encourage survivors, and I think our, our group does a pretty good job about this uh, in this regard, being in touch being in touch with yourself. Um, sometimes we're our own worst enemies and we try to do too much and think we can do it. And it causes a great deal of anxiety to stop, to be in the moment and realize what our needs are and then know your own coping tools, whether it's taking a break of five minutes to just be still, to be quiet, um, to, to recenter ourselves, a lot of folks enjoy yoga, meditation. Uh, maybe it's listening to music, whatever it is. And you know, maybe it's this right here. Maybe it's this, well, maybe it's a cell phone and technology. We're constantly connected and checking. And, and sometimes we just have to put, put the phone down, turn the TV off and just be calm and regroup. But the first key, I think, is to just be self-aware and acknowledge that we just need a break and take, take that five minutes. That's great advice. And so do you want to talk a little bit about the benefits of the meetup during the pandemic? 
because pivot is the word of the year, right, guys? <laughs> Instead of in-person events and meeting face-to-face, -face, <coughs> we all had to pivot in ways to care for ourselves, care for, for the folks that we we um, that we're caring for. So what are the benefits of virtual groups like like the ones that you manage? Without the, and I'm so proud, I am so proud of organizations like Longevity and Cancer Pathways and, and others that have pivoted during the pandemic and found another way to support, uh, to support our, our patients and our survivors, those that we're blessed to, to serve. Um, you know, in my, in my 30 plus year nursing career, we didn't do social media. You didn't dare pull your phone out at work and you sure didn't text and Facebook with patients and all. And it's a new day. It is a new day in lung cancer. Um, I'll get to our meetups. Uh, I want to talk about that and answer your question. But I, I encourage folks that are not familiar with our longevity website to make sure that you check it out. There is a fantastic world of information at your fingertips from uh, the different platforms, the lung cancer support community, the different uh, the Facebook groups and pages. There's a wealth of information out there. But back to your question about the meetups. Uh, our meetups are, I think, an amazing time, and I'm, I'm so proud that, that, that you all had, our leaders had the vision to, to move in this direction. Um, it's an opportunity for cancer survivors to come together. First rule, everybody gets a pass. You know, we bring what we have every day. Some days are better than others, and you just bring what you have. Um, the meetups are an opportunity in the world of a pandemic and being isolated, it's an opportunity to be face-to-face, -face, just like we are right now, to support one another, to learn from one another, and to, uh, to grow, to grow as a community. Um, we have great meetups. We have amazing survivors. Um, some days their conversations are um, really, really inspiring. There are days that they're... Um, that there are some tough conversations that we have because lung cancer is tough. And in these meetups, we come together face-to-face, -to -face, we share, we talk, we explore. I wish I could just, just hug everybody. It's an amazing family. And um, I, I think that the survivors seem to really, to really enjoy the opportunity. Thank you, Chris. To have FaceTime. Thank you so much. And can you tell everybody when they are? Maybe just throw the link in the in the chat just in case anybody's interested in joining. Absolutely. Maybe Nicole or I, we can we can certainly do that. Currently, our meetups are uh, we have anywhere from uh, four to five a week at the present. Uh, our, weed, our meetups are at noon Eastern on Monday and Wednesday. Yes, noon Eastern. And on Fridays, they're at 1.30 Eastern. In addition to a happy hour uh, meetup, that's Friday evening. Not every day and every time works for all survivors. Uh, managing maybe kids at home, maybe working full time, having a job. It's great that there's an evening option as well. In addition to that, I don't know if y'all know this or not, but we have something called the Caregiver Connection. It is a, it's a virtual meetup dedicated to our amazing caregivers and a time for them to come together as well. Currently, that's on the fourth Thursday of every month. So check your calendar. I say that, and this year with the holidays in December, I think we've had to scooch that up a week. So I think it's on Thursday, December the 16th right now uh, for, for the month of December. And Katie, if I may, in addition to our general meetups, our team, our survivorship team, uh, I, I like to think we're small but mighty. Um, we have had the privilege of launching Onc Gene specific meetups this, uh, this fall. And so stay tuned for that. Uh, we will have Onc Gene specific meetups in 2022, which is just coming up, y'all, in three or four weeks. So stay tuned for that as well. That's going to be a, a fantastic way. The launch went well. 
And um, survivors, while everyone enjoys the general meetups, the oncogene specific meetups are a great way to come together for folks with EGFR or uh, small cell folks or the KRAS group uh, and also the rare mutations and the no mutation folks. It's a great way to come together with folks with uh, similar mutations, again, to learn and share. Am I frozen? So that is, um, those are our virtual meetups, kind of an overview. And I was talking and I haven't checked the chat, but I think we've got some, some survivors uh, that are familiar with longevity that are, that are with us today. And so um, our amazing survivors are what, are what, make the meetups um, wonderful, Excellent. learning and supporting each other. And who better than someone in, in, that's on the same path? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Christy. We're lucky to have you. Patients are lucky to have you. Happy to be here. All right. Our last portion of the program is dedicated to resources. I would love to invite uh, Dr. Mary Nichols, program I'm director for Camp Pathway, introduce her team and to share with us what Cancer Pathways is. Mary? Hi, hi everyone. Um, it is a pleasure to be here. I absolutely love the, the, the presentations and hearing uh, Carol, hearing your story, it was wonderful. Um, I'm the program director at Cancer Pathways and I'm joined with my uh, teammates uh, Lauren Bonneau, who is our program manager for community education, and Anna Gottlieb, who is our founder and executive director. Now, since Cancer Pathways, uh, formerly Gilda's Club, is now celebrating its 20th year, I thought this would be a great um, opportunity for Anna to talk about um, uh, Cancer Pathways, uh, formerly Gilda's Club Seattle. And I think you're on mute. I, I now I'm unmuted. Um, thank you so much. It was a great presentation. And Carol, I have to say you're hired. So, you know, you are somebody who should not only be talking to lung cancer patients, but to all cancer patients, because the advice and the wisdom you've learned along the way is something I think everybody needs to hear. And it's so important because first thing people do when they're diagnosed, you want education. And as you said, you get the best education from your peers, from your support groups, from longevity. And that's who you turn to. And I also have to say that I really like the word meetups because I think support groups sometimes have a bad um, connection to people. So I really like the word meetup. So I commend you for using that word to get people to join. I, I worry about all the people sitting home alone that don't join these groups that are in fear and isolation when we don't need to be. And that was pretty much how Gilda's Club was founded is that so no one has to face cancer alone. We all wanna face it together. Everybody has wisdom to share and it's a lot easier to do it with other people and peers in, in so what we call support group, but in meetups, which I really like. So, um, you know, Gilda Radner died very young at age 42 of ovarian cancer, and her husband, Jean Wilder, wanted to start something in her name because she had started going to a, a support group, and it made all the difference for her. And so when she died, they did start Gilda's Clubs. Um, we are now part of Cancer Support Community, and we are now called Cancer Pathways, and we are in Seattle. This is our 20th year, so we're trying to celebrate our 20th anniversary by taking a look back and taking a look forward at all the things we've been able to accomplish and all the things that we know still have to be done. I think lung cancer, particularly for women, is a huge issue. And I, I'm happy to see more about that and more in the, in the news, more in the media, more in research, more in everything, because I think Women have been left out a lot of some certain things, 
And I think this is, is the time has come. And we have a lot of women that are lung cancer survivors in our group and in our circle. So we're really glad. But, you know, our goal really is to make sure nobody is sitting there home alone and to make sure we have programs for everybody at every stage at every turn. And I will turn it over to our program director, Mary, who runs all our phenomenal programs. But Carol, really, you're hired. So just call me tomorrow. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. I'll call you bright and early. OK. <laughs> Good. Thank I've you got very plans. much. I have plans for you, Carol. OK. Well. <laughs> Michelle, look what you've got me into. Yes, I have plans for you. This was a mistake, Carol. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I really appreciate your kindness and encouragement. Thank you. Um, so thank you. I'm, I'm going to share my screen right now with everyone. So uh, bear with me for a second here. And I am just going to put it in presentation mode. Here we go. Okay. Um, so uh, Anna did a wonderful job talking about cancer pathways and um, why we started Cancer Pathways. Um, you know, for 20 years we've been we're a can we've been providing um, education, support, and community for those impacted by cancer. And as Anna mentioned, you know, our mission is facing cancer together. Mm -hmm. All of our programs are offered, um, are provided at no cost to participants, thanks to the generosity of our donors. And, you know, as Christy and Carol both mentioned, you know, um, can, the cancer takes a toll on so many different levels beyond, you know, the effect it has on the body. Um, you know, it, it takes a toll on your relationship, it takes a toll on your mental health on you know, people's uh, ability to work, on their finances. It's, it's just, um, there are so many complexities and there are so many levels to the, you know, of needs. And so at Cancer Pathways for the last 20 years, you know, we, we've been spending a lot of time you know, trying to optimize these programs so they're responsive to the needs of the community. And so you know, we, we listen to what our support members tell us. We listen to the community. And as a result of that listening, you know, emerged these major programs. Um, you know, we learned that, you know, for many children, their childhood is really disrupted and it has an impact on, you know, on kids, you know, whether the kid has cancer or whether someone else in their family has cancer. And so that's why we started Camp Sparkle. And, um, you know, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about Camp Sparkle, but that's for kids. And we also have a teen education program. I thought it was great listening to Dr. Basu Roy's uh, talk where he talked about cancer risk factors. And you know, that's what we talk about in high schools. We've, been, uh, we've seen over 110,000 teens so far in classrooms. We work with educators and you know, we're trying to take the fear out of their lives. You know, we wanna empower them with information, know that here are some things they can do to address risk factors. Um, but at the same time, cancer happens and there are resources available and there's a community to support them. We also have a teen writing contest and I'll talk about that a little bit more, but it's really a place for teens to um, share their stories with us and with the world. And we, in addition, we have a workplace support program called Cancer Illuminated. And, you know, there we really try to uncover the workplace challenges people face um, when they're trying to get back to work, when they're trying to support colleagues. And, you know, so what we do is we, we will be having um, more webinars next year and partnering with other organizations to address those needs and talk about those issues. And we also have support groups. And, you know, Carol is uh, one of the members of our support group and, you know, um, when someone reaches out to us, you know, as, as we heard, it's overwhelming when you hear that you have a diagnosis or someone in your family has it. And so when people reach out to us, you know, we try to get back to them within 24 hours. Michelle is our social worker who does that. And, you know, she, she does a fabulous job in reaching out to people and trying to understand what are their needs and match people to the groups that would work for them. And so, as you can see, we have a number of 
uh, support groups. Currently, they're all virtual. We have a living with cancer support group, a caregiver support group, a bereavement, workplace support, lung cancer, parents living with cancer, parents grief. Um, and we also have mindfulness-based art and Thoughtful Thursday. In addition to these support groups, we have yoga, we have um, like music therapy, we have um, cooking, we have other things to also help um, build that sense of community for people. Um, what's really great about this is just people having a sense of belonging, a safe place to process their emotions and to exchange information and learn from each other. And as Anna mentioned, you know, they are the best teachers, you know, uh, with each other about what to talk, to, you know, what to ask doctors about, or, you know, what you should know about this space. And as I mentioned, you know, the teen writing contest now is open. And this is a national contest where teens write essays up to 1500 words. And they, they talk about the impact cancer has had on their lives. It could be a personal diagnosis. It could be that of a loved one. And, you know, uh, they win, those with the winning essays are awarded $1,000 and they're invited to a, an annual reception we host. And at the annual reception, they read their essays aloud. They get to meet the other teens and their families get to hear the essays too. And what's fascinating is to hear the stories come from parents and family members and loved ones saying, wow, this is the first time I heard my kid talk about um, this experience. And it's just eye-opening. And so because of that eye-opening experience, and we feel it's important to amplify the voices of teens. And so we post the winning essays on our website. And so that way others can read um, these essays and, you know, and it, there's uh, people will know that they're not alone. Others share their experiences. And so if you know someone who's a high school team, we encourage you to submit and ask them to submit an essay. Camp Sparkle is um, something we've, we've had this for over 13 years. It's an exciting uh, program for us this year. We had both online camp and on-site camp. Our on-site camp is in Seattle, Bellevue and Tacoma and Everett. And they are a week long day camps. And we also had online camp on Zoom, and that's for everyone across the US. Uh, they both are very different, but they both did something, they have something in common. There's an adventure, there are uh, therapeutic activities where kids you know, learn how to communicate and process those emotions uh, that arise from the impact of cancer in their lives. And they get to share um, and bond over common experiences. And so, you know, if you have kids or know someone who has a kid who might be interested in camp, we encourage you to get on our newsletter so that you'll know when camp opens up and the slots fill up rather quickly. And finally, um, you know, I also want to touch on community education. That's what this lecture is about. We're glad that this is the second time we're doing this with Longevity. And Longevity is a fantastic partner. Um, we love how uh, they really are able to talk about um, updates in lung cancer research with such eloquence and clarity and, um, and just the passion and how much they care about the community. And so, you know, what this is about for us at Cancer Pathways is really building collaborative communities. It's um, by partnering with other uh, groups like Longevity and, you know, putting the spotlight on their resources too and you know, providing these educational webinars. We also, um, with community education, it's about raising awareness, discussing shared challenges we have in this field. And you know, in addition to webinars, you know, we like to encourage people to you know, get out of the house and, and do something. And you know, that doing something, in, in this case, we've done is partner with Bloodworks Northwest and you know, have blood drives and say, donate blood, we need that. Um, in addition to community education, another um, pillar of that is to empower people with information that can really promote lifelong learning and also lifelong care, self-care. So, you know, our webinars cover self-care and we also have resource guides on our website. In addition, uh, for professionals and educators, we offer continuing education credits and clock hours. So, you know, community education program is really the arm where we're really connecting with other strong organizations to make it easier for people to, you know, um, navigate this space uh, regarding information and resources. And finally, a lot of our webinars, we do post it on a YouTube channel. 
And here are some examples of webinars we've had in recently. We've had hypnotherapy for cancer. Um, we've had Jin Shin Jitsu. We've had music therapy um, and this event. And you know, we have a lot more coming up for next year. So again, if this is something that interests you, please uh, let us know. We're happy to share more information and also get you signed up. So thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Nicholas. We have loved partnering with you guys. And there's nothing like being in person when you can give hugs and, and be face to face, but this is the next best thing. So thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you to the, um, the, can the entire Cancer Pathways team. And on behalf of Longevity and Cancer Pathways, thank you everyone for joining us today. Throughout this program, links were put in the chat. Um, for personal resources and events, and to complement what you're getting in your local communities, um, people can get help navigating their lung cancer diagnosis from our website, from the Cancer Pathways website, um, our lung cancer helpline, from survivor and caregiver mentors who have been where they are. Uh, Longevity offers peer-to-peer -peer lifeline support where we will connect lung cancer patients to survivors and caregivers to other caregiver mentors to get and give advice, encouragement, and hope. Uh, we do have those virtual patient Zoom meetups four times a week. And Anna, you're right. We use the word meetup because support group really deterred a lot of people. There are a lot of people who say, you know, I don't need support. I'm great. I don't believe in all that. But I want to talk to other people like me. Um, they don't, they don't under, they don't get that that's support too, but we won't tell them that. <laughs> we have meetups four times a week, um, at least four times a week, multiple private patient and caregiver groups online. Um, and those, those are multiple ways for people to get connected and, and get involved in the fight against lung cancer. Um, we have online groups on Facebook, private patient groups that uh, for all the different oncogene types, as well as for those diagnosed with small cell. And when there's not a pandemic, we host multiple in-person events across the country at hospitals and uh, pan cancer organizations, um, and also nurse navigators at the community level. So anyone with lungs can get lung cancer and we want patients and their families to know that you do not have to go through this alone. You can learn more about Cancer Pathways at www.cancerpathways.org and longevity at www.longevity.org. And you can call our Lung Cancer Helpline at 844-360-5864 to get connected and find financial resources. So thank you everyone for participating. Anna, Dr. Nicholas, Christy, Carol, um, who am I missing? Dr. Moore, Dr. Upal Basaroy, Lauren. Um, it's been a great program. And until next time, keep safe, everyone. Thank you so much. And thank you, Longevity. <laughs>